So good morning all and welcome to session seven in our Essential Skills Insight series. This session will be delivered by Trish Turley in Sims for Training and is on an engineer's guide to stakeholder management. Trish is the founder and director of Sims for Training and they specialize in using artificial intelligence simulations in the areas of project and change management. So I'd like to thank Flowgas for continuing their, their powering this series and sponsoring the series. And before I hand over to Trish, I'd like to just go through some housekeeping. So I hope you can hear and see us. And if you're having any issues, use the chat function and myself and my colleague Quiva will help you. You can find the Q&A function and that's where we'll ask you to interact with us this morning. And you can find the Q&A function for the uh, 15 minute Q&A at the end. So at the end of Trisha's presentation, you can use the Q&A function and we'll call out your questions. So please do interact with us this morning. And then at the end of the session, you will receive a PDF copy of the notes. And your feedback is extremely valuable. So we'd ask you to also take the online survey. So without further ado, it's my pleasure now to hand over to Trish. Thank you, Trish. Thanks, Elva. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. I'm Trish Thurley. I'm a, a stakeholder engagement specialist and, as Elva mentioned, founder of Sims for Training. So we're an innovative training company and we use AI simulations to help people learn by doing. A bit more on that later. And we're focusing on stakeholder engagement and project management. I myself have over 30 years experience in projects and change and I've worked in 38 countries around the globe. You know, those days when we were allowed to travel, can you remember those? <laughs> I also lecture at a top business school and, and I'm a long-term member of the Association for Project Management. So we equip people with um, the people skills or soft skills to, to benefit their projects and their organizations. And we're looking to achieve better outcomes. Um, it, it's basically all about uh, achieving sustainable change and better results, not just for the shareholders of our projects, but for all stakeholders. And that sustainability is really important to me. So I'm here today to give an engineer's guide to stakeholder engagement and management. And I refer to this as cat herding skills because that's sometimes how it just feels. I really look forward to hearing your questions at the end of the session. And as, as Elva mentioned as well, I'm accompanied by my colleague, Ralph Allen, and he'll be keeping an eye, eye on the chat for me and interacting with some of you as well. So if you could save the questions to the end, um, but I want to start first of all with a question for you. It's not a question I want you to answer now, but it's a question that I want you to think about. Do you think you could find two minutes a day to do something that would make a massive difference to your success. I'm going to talk more about how we do that later on, but perhaps you could be pondering that question while we look at the uh, journey that we're going to take today. So from attending today, you're going to gain an insight into what really works in the stakeholder engagement field and evidence why this is really important to project success and also an understanding of how stakeholders make decisions. So over the next 40 minutes, I'm gonna ask you next to vote in a poll about your key stakeholder challenges. So you might want to be thinking about that, ready to put those in the poll. And then we'll look at two contrasting case studies and then move on to sharing some insight into ensuring success and key benefits of getting it right. We'll Talk, finish off by talking about how you can do all this stuff in under two minutes a day. I know it sounds impossible, but honestly, uh, trust me, it will be. And then the Q&A, as we've mentioned. So without further ado, um, I will uh, put up the um, poll um, slide here and I'm going to launch the first poll. So you should see polling launch. And this is a multiple choice one. And it's about what stakeholder skill, oh, sorry, I've picked the wrong one here, sorry. Um, apologies there, it's gone on to question two rather than question one. Right, sorry, we're on the wrong, right one now. Okay, what stakeholder challenges do you have? It's a multi-choice um, with a, a, a number of questions here and you can vote on any of those ones. So your biggest challenges. 
And if the challenge for you isn't there, we've got an other category six. So you can put something into chat if it's other as well. So, so some of you are voting too many stakeholders. I don't have time for them all. How do we involve the right stakeholders in the decision making? And uh, leading at the moment is my stakeholders have different and conflicting agendas. And uh, how do I manage those who are senior to me? How do I manage upwards, really? And stakeholders not responding uh, to my communications. So, uh, yeah, it's like watching the, uh, the Grand National, which I watched the other week with the uh, runners and riders here. But the conflicting agendas is out front at the moment there. OK, so um, I, I'd say uh, there, uh, I don't think anybody has put an other in there yet, so there shouldn't be one. I think um, we've the vast majority of people have voted here. So I'll end the polling and share the results at this point here. Um, so should now be able to see that. So yeah, I, I really find that that is a, 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 an issue for me, uh, the conflicting agendas. They all want different things. And uh, often you, you end up with a situation where it's he or she who shouts loudest that gets the attention. And you can feel a, a sense of stress and overwhelm. Like you just can't please anyone. Uh, in my own experience of big organizational change projects, I often found this stakeholder piece um, is, uh, was um, a, a bit like pushing water uphill with a fork. You know, it was really difficult to get buy-in and support. Uh, so hopefully you can see those results there. And uh, if I could ask uh, uh, Elvira Quiva just to take a, um, a copy of those results for us for later on, that would be great as well. Okay, so let's just close that down for the moment here. Um, I mentioned this sense of overwhelm. You can feel like a human pinball. And it's at the point at which many people just give up uh, and they just crack on with the technical and logistical aspects of the projects. These technical and logistical aspects can be like a siren call of my comfort zone pulling you away from those messy human socio-political problems. One of the things that I found helpful was learning to apply some science to the problem right at the start and to build stakeholder engagement into my planning like it was a technical problem. Um, it was also important to identify who the most powerful, best connected and influential stakeholders are, who's got the biggest stake in what you're trying to do, and um, uh, also learning to utilise their social network. Everybody has a social network and increasingly those social networks are wider and bigger. Uh, so learning how to use those and getting people to advocate for me um, so that people influence on my behalf. But most importantly, I learned some basic psychology around how people are motivated and how they make decisions. So I'm going to share more on that shortly. But what I want to do is to start with a great example of stakeholder engagement. Our first um, uh, case study that we're going to look at, which is the Thames Tideway Tunnel. OK, so my husband said over breakfast one day, how would you like to visit a massive sewer? It, it wasn't the best invitation I'd had that week, uh, despite the COVID uh, restrictions. Uh, but my husband is an engineer through and through, and I'm a scientist, but what we share is an innate sense of curiosity. So this invitation aroused my curiosity. And I took him up on the offer to visit the Blackfriars site of the Thames Tideway Tunnel. And it was a revelation, I have to say. The project's a technical miracle, but it's also a textbook case of fantastic stakeholder engagement. Tideway are the company building this super sewer, and they won the ED Building and Infrastructure Project of the Year Award in 2021. I'm just going to quote from the judges. They said, despite its scale, Tideway has integrated environmental and social impacts into its core approach from day one. Um, it's 
championed many innovative approaches which really push the boundaries and show a positive way forward for future infrastructure projects. Closer inspection has confirmed that great stakeholder engagement was a key to their success. So I'm going to describe a bit more about the a brief description of the project for those who aren't familiar with it, as it's, it's called the uh, London Super Sewer. So it'll be a 25 kilometre tunnel running mostly under the tidal section of the River Thames through central London. Uh, they can't build these huge access shafts in built up London, so they've had to do it all, almost all under the river. So the idea is it captures, store and conveys almost all the raw sewage and rainwater that currently overflows into the river. Uh, they started it in 2016, it's due to open in 2025, and it's costing round about 4.2 billion. So a little bit more about the technical detail. So uh, they're using gravity to help move the waste along, which means it gets deeper as it progresses, which is a challenge in itself. But if you see from the diagram, they had to drill and tunnel in, in clay, in sand and in chalk at different sort of levels. And if you look at the root itself, how it wiggles around and how that terrain changes, you can see why this wasn't a straightforward or hasn't been a straightforward uh, engineering type project. Just to give you a, a sense of scale, here's a closer look at one of the access shafts. Um, and, you know, this, you imagine uh, in, in central London, you know, it, it caused a lot of upheaval in lots of ways. Um, like most of our projects, stakeholders want benefits, but they, they don't want the project itself. So there is an element with our stakeholders that we have to sell the pain in order to get the gain and focus on the benefits. Now, multi-billion pound projects like this, they've got a specific budget and significant resources for stakeholder engagement. But not all projects are lucky enough to have that. But we have to remember that in today's world, just about everybody that we see has a, a, a photographing and recording device on them at all times in the form of their mobile phone. So it really means that we all carry the responsibility of being a stakeholder engagement manager. So how can we maximize this opportunity and avoid the potential threats that that, that poses? Well, I think one of the keys here is to gain a clear understanding of the raison d'etre of the project. What problem does it set out to solve? So let's examine their problem in a bit more detail. So Londoners love the Thames and they've even created beaches on the shoreline. So if and when we get a summer, people will be out there in their deck chairs. And like the mad dogs that we are, some people even like to swim in it. Uh, so of all the Londoners surveyed, 50% uh, said they would swim in the Thames and over 30% of respondents said they actually had swim in the Thames. Well, if anybody's thinking about doing that, uh, uh, the advice is don't. If you think about everything that you put down your toilet, that's essentially what you'd be swimming in. Nice, eh? Uh, the original sewer system was built back in the 1850s and when it can't cope with the raw sewage that gets dumped in the Thames. So there's been a panorama program this week criticising the illegal dumping by water companies of untreated sewage in the rivers. Uh, England and Wales got pointed out so um, Ireland I think maybe uh, maybe much better at this than, than, than uh, we are at the moment but um, yeah it doesn't cope and I've been told that apparently 40 times the volume of Wembley Stadium in raw sewage is dumped in the Thames every year. Great eh? So if we just take go back to how it was um, you know the inception of the original sewage system 1858 the Thames was a filthy death trap even more so than now and the first sewer system was built by engineer Joseph Bazalgette. Um, there's some um, uh, original photos of its construction. Uh, those of you who are in kind of civil and constructions, I'm sure you don't arrive on site in a top hat and a, and a, um, a frock coat as they did in those days, but it's quite uh, something to see, isn't it? 
And uh, to remember at the time, in the 1850s, there were only about 2 million people in London. But Joseph Bazalgette, being forward thinking guy, uh, he planned it to take up to 4 million people. Um, so you could see that London was expanding. But by 2020, the population of London was nearer 9 million. So you can see uh, that uh, it wouldn't cope. Just as an aside, the financing vehicle for the new project is called Baseljet Tunnel Limited in, in tribute to Joseph himself. So he lives on, he's famous. And uh, unfortunately, the old system's in a bit of a state. There's these legendary fatbergs that have been causing quite a few issues and have regularly hit the headlines. Um, so for the stakeholders, it's really important to keep selling the benefits, the solution to the problem, rather than the project itself. Uh, I know uh, that it's quite easy to get carried away in the technical details of the project and forget about the actual solution at the end of it. So here's an aerial shot of that Blackfriars site that I got the chance to go on site at. And you can see how they created a temporary barrier to hold back the Thames and create a space to sink the access shafts. There's a number of these all the way along. As we go through the case study, I'm gonna be mentioning some groups of stakeholders who've been engaged in the planning. And I'm sure you can think of loads of other groups that should or, or would have been engaged in a project like this. So if you wanna add someone to chat that, that I haven't mentioned, uh, but the obvious group here to start with is engineers and architects contractors and technical specialists, because it's a Leviathan technical project. But also local businesses uh, spring to mind in this sort of area and the areas where the shafts are being sunk and the, the works are going on. And also the commuters who use Blackfriars Station are stakeholder groups as well. So, um, Let's just move on and look at a glimpse down one of the shafts, just to give a sense of scale. That arrow there, the red arrow is pointing at a cement mixer truck at the bottom of the shaft. Uh, so that spring brings to mind other stakeholder groups like raw materials suppliers and of course the essential construction workers as well. Uh, a bit more on them later. The tunnels themselves are a lot smaller in diameter than the actual shafts, but they could still accommodate three double-decker buses side by side. And uh, this uh, diagram is courtesy of Tideway's active media and PR team, um, reminding stakeholders all the brilliant work that is going on out of sight uh, underneath London. Uh, they've even uh, named the tunneling machines uh, they've called, given them names like Selena and Annie, and there's an app on the site uh, where you can track their progress. It's really cute. So this has allowed them to engage local schools and um, colleges and universities in that project as well. Not forgetting, of course, the environmental impact of our projects and the waste from the tunneling that's all being transported by barge to reduce the carbon footprint. Um, and the uh, spoil itself is being reused lower down the Thames on construction projects. So environmentalists of every, every type are, are interested in this project, as is the Port of London Authority, the Mayor of London, and all the other river users and the barges who might be involved in this project as well. Here's an architect's view of the final park that will be created on top of the access shaft at Blackfriars. I wonder if those happy park dwellers are aware that they're standing on millions of litres of liquid sewage. So local residents and tourism companies and Londoners in general are all stakeholders to this project. Some that haven't been such happy uh, 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 bunnies are the local residents, which I'll talk about in a moment, but there's another Im impressive aspect to the project, which is um, looking after the employees, the health and safety training. They spent over four million on this training, which is an immersive full day role play. And it's massively impactful. I've experienced it myself. So employees health and safety, including their mental health, is front and center of the project. Uh, while I was at this training, I heard a horrific statistic. The risk of suicide amongst low-skilled male labourers, particularly those working in construction, 
is three times higher than the male national average, which is pretty high in itself. So Tidewave got a multitude of proactive projects and they're clearly in evidence on site to prevent their employees adding to this gruesome statistic. So health, safety and mental health at the forefront. And the person responsible for, for this is the uh, CEO, Andy Mitchell. Uh, as a guest at one of the health and safety training days, we met him because he was serving sandwiches, which he does at all these days, because he really wants to send the message that this is hugely important. And he, he cares passionately about the need to eat, sleep and, sleep and breathe a safe, inclusive and diverse culture. He told us as well that the, re the local residents, particularly around Blackfriars where we're visiting, they've been less than fans of this project and it does cause a lot of noise and disruption. Uh, the pressure group Save Our Riverside, Barney Holbesh has said, uh, we formed the impression that if we ran into a brick wall with our uh, protest, uh, that Andy would be a reasonable court of appeal. He came to address them and people were impressed with him because he's a genuinely nice guy but they did say they would like to see a bit more of him. So, you know, they, these are the people who are opposed to the project. They wanna see more of this guy. Another one, Anne Rosenberg-Bell, uh, she describes Mitchell as easy to talk to, sympathetic and, a, and uh, willing to listen. And those listening skills are super important. And that's despite her fierce opposition to the tunnel. Um, Andy himself said he understands the complaints. He says, we have to understand how our neighbours feel. The fear is very different to the reality. The truth is, once it's up and running, it'll look more like a B&Q than a construction site. And, but some people have been led to believe that they'll be living in an open cast mine and, and it, it'll be just dust and rubbish everywhere. And that, that really isn't the case. So let's move on now. Uh, to the um, second case study. I'm clearly a supporter of uh, the Tideway Tunnel example of excellence, but I often find that we learn a lot more from disasters. So what I've got here is a short YouTube video on the woeful story of Berlin Brandenburg Airport. And this thing, it, it just tells the story way more succinctly than I could. Um, so if, if our technology is with us at this point, uh, then there should be, we should be okay to go with the five minute video. So let's try. Berlin has some truly atrocious, horrifying things in its past. Its airports. They're just bad and ancient. Tegel Airport, for example, is worse rated on Google than the nearby prison, and Schonenfeld, meanwhile, is worse rated than Aleppo Airport, which is in an active war zone. But why are there two bad airports instead of just one? Well, that's because, decades ago, it was rather difficult to get from this side of Berlin to this side. Basically, World War II ended, the city was split up into zones administered by the different allies, and the Soviets, figuring that making their bit of the city not suck would be harder, just built a wall to stop everyone from leaving for West Berlin. Given that, there were the airports for West Berlin, Tempelhof and Tegel, and there was the airport for East Berlin, Schonenfeld. When the wall became not, the city therefore had three airports, one of which closed down in 2008. This was inefficient, so the city decided to build one big, not sucky airport. After many committees and conferences and comments, they decided on a site. They would build the new airport directly south of the old Schonenfeld airport, and that way they could use one of the old runways for the new airport. Fast forward to 2012, the era of Gangnam Style, Honey Boo Boo, and the end of the world, and the airport was nearly finished, so Berlin got ready for a massive moving operation. On the night of June 2nd, the last ever aircraft would land at each of Berlin's bad old airports, and then, throughout the night, all the people and equipment from them would drive their way over to the new Brandenburg Airport. The planning for this move had been going on for years. The city would close major highways, TV networks were arranging live coverage, extra staff had been hired, airlines had sold tickets from the new airport for months, Lufthansa planned a celebratory A380 flight to mark the first arrival to the new airport, Angela Merkel was scheduled to attend an opening ceremony. It was all about to happen until, just 26 days before the move, the word came down that it would not happen. The opening was delayed. That was 2012. Nowadays, in 2019, that new airport, Berlin Brandenburg Airport is still nowhere near opening. Here's what happened with this fire festival of an airport. 
Construction began on September 5, 2006. Bob and the other builders worked relatively fast, and by 2011, the airport was looking enough like an airport that they started tests where more than 10,000 volunteers would check in a bag, go through security, board a dummy plane, and then go and collect their bags at the baggage claim. The airport looked like it was almost ready for opening, and shops were already leased out and getting ready for opening, but that's when problems emerged. In what was thought to be the final days of construction, a lot of what was going on was certifying that different aspects of the airport wouldn't kill people. That's the job of cars. The worst method of transportation, don't at me. The German inspectors, though, were especially concerned with making sure that the airport's fire alarm and suppression system was up to snuff, given that only 15 years earlier, the worst airport fire in the history of airport fires had destroyed much of Dusseldorf Airport elsewhere in Germany. Therefore, they simulated a fire by releasing smoke and my mixtape. Some alarms went off, many did not, some others went off but in the complete wrong part of the building, and it turned out that the mess of wiring that was causing all these alarm issues was, in and of itself, a fire hazard, and apparently the inspectors didn't subscribe to the fight fire with fire methodology. It was also found that the vents built to suck out smoke just simply didn't work and would likely implode in a real fire. Long story short, the airport's fire system was a complete failure. The fire inspectors felt it worthwhile to point out that the nearby Tropical Islands Resort, a water park, had a more complicated fire suppression system that actually worked, the implication being that the water park was better designed than the airport. The project managers desperately wanted to open on time though, so they proposed that, instead of having an alarm system, they would hire 800 low-paid workers to stand around the terminal and act as, quote, fire spotters. As much as I appreciate them writing my jokes for me, the inspectors didn't and said hell nine. The next day, 26 days before opening, the airport's opening was delayed. Over the next few years, opening was delayed and delayed and delayed again as they just couldn't fix that fire system. It emerged that there were other issues as well though. There weren't enough check-in desks for the expected passenger numbers, 4,000 doors were numbered incorrectly, and for a period in 2015, construction workers weren't even allowed in the building because they were worried the roof would collapse. Another huge issue, though, emerged in 2017. The whole idea of the airport was to act as a large hub airport for Europe where passengers would connect from flight to flight. All the financial calculations were based on this. For example, the revenue of shops was figuring that many passengers would be connecting through, which would have them lingering around longer. The big crucial detail, though, was that there was only one airline with a hub in Berlin. That was Air Berlin, and in late 2017, Air Berlin became insolvent and shut down. Therefore, Berlin's major hub airport would have no airline hubs, and with no airline hubs, it would be barely any connecting passengers. The delays and their implications had become comical at this point. In 2018, the airport had to replace 750 screens for departure boards at a cost of more than $500,000 since they had left them on continuously for six years and they had reached the end of their service lives. Today, in 2019, the fire suppression system still is not working and the current official opening date of October 2020 is looking less and less realistic. Some have even suggested that the airport will never open and will just be torn down completely. Inside though, the airport still sits there, looking close to brand new, but yet completely non-functional. A modern $8.5 billion airport that has never had a single passenger. Oh dear, what can we take away from this woeful tale? Uh, it was even worse that it, when they did try to open it that uh, Extinction Rebellion put on a big protest march outside uh, the front, so it just seemed to be a catalogue of disasters. It, it seems to me uh, that, you know, the, the stakeholders who weren't engaged and consulted early, fire safety among others, just exacted their revenge. The, the project seems to have failed to pay heed to those who could have pointed out that for the, you know, a single point of failure with Air Berlin being the only carrier to use the airport as a hub, my experience is that people don't fall over themselves to share their valuable experience uh, and technical exp expertise with you if they don't trust you or if they feel it will fall on deaf ears. So without dwelling on the uh, catalogue of woe, uh, let's just look at what will help you to avoid some of the pitfalls. Um, I mentioned earlier that I found it really helped to understand some basic psychology of human behavior uh, for stakeholder engagement. A lot of our education as scientists, as, as technicians, as engineers, uh, it, it's around the logic and the technical detail. Um, but I 
you know, I just love to understand how things work and I, lead, I need to be able to understand cause and effect. But people are just a bit messy and complicated. Uh, you might well have come across this iceberg model, uh, which attempts to explain some aspects uh, of how we show our logical side to the world, but we only in, in reveal our intrinsic or inner motivation to those that we trust. And if you don't mind, I'll illustrate this with a little story. Um, imagine you've just bought a car and we were discussing why you chose a particular model. You might talk to me about the fuel efficiency or the, the seating capacity or the great finance deal that you got, or, or maybe the safety standards. And these are all good logical reasons for buying something. It's only when they know you better, you might reveal, as a, a colleague did to me recently, she updated her car because she, she became embarrassed that all the neighbours had newer models on the drive. So this is an example of how the social um, interactions can affect you know, people's perceptions. When we understand human beings better, we know that all our decisions are ultimately made with the heart, and we then justify those decisions with the logic afterwards. So uh, meet Rex, he's my car. So if you ask me why I bought a Lexus, I might share its impressive fuel economy figures or, or, the, or the reliability data as justification for the purchase. Once I know you better, I might share some elements of the social influence on my decision. Um, so I, I was acutely aware that um, my old gas guzzling four wheel drive, um, which was nicknamed the Chelsea tractor, um, wasn't really cool. And I really felt I should drive a, a more eco friendly model. So Rex is a hybrid. My inner circle of friends and family will probably be aware that Toyota and Lexus have been a client of mine for over 15 years, and I identify really strongly with their ethos of sustainability. So that's what drove me to buy Rex. Conversely, if you meet um, Bessie, this is my husband's car, and she's a Morgan, and she can best be described as a loosely assembled kit of parts. And you've got to, you really got to be a mechanical engineer just to drive her. He, he bought her off a colleague, John, 20 years ago, and, and she'd, she'd been bought as a vehicle to, for his wife to carry the four kids to school. I ask you, you know, uh, well, that was the excuse he used. But when you drive Bessie down the road, kids and adults alike, they just stop and point because she's beautiful and she makes your heart sing. Um, Early in our marriage, we took Bessie on a touring holiday in Ireland and we arrived uh, by overnight ferry into Cork and we were tired and we were disorientated by a rough crossing and we got hideously lost in Cork. We ended up stressed, arguing and driving down a one way street the wrong way. Um, we were actually on our way and it was before Google Maps or iPhones and we were trying to get to the famous Jimson's distillery for a tour. And we got confronted by another driver who was going the right way uh, up the one way street. And we, we kind of readied ourselves for a massive rage road incident because in London at this point, you'd get your head ripped off your shoulders. So it was with trepidation that we uh, we smiled at this approaching stranger. And his opening words were, you're not from around here, are you? And it was such a friendly tone. And, and then he proceeded to admire Bessie and to offer to guide us across Cork, going out of his way to pick up the right results. So the result of that was to give us a lasting affection for the people of Cork and for Ireland in general, and an even bigger lasting affection, I have to say, for the triple distilled smoothness of the Jimsons, which uh, we did get to try. But what I'm illustrating here from my story is you don't persuade and influence human beings using logic. And the quicker you can uncover their intrinsic motivation or their inner motivation, the sooner you can build trust. And then you can influence and persuade them. They're human beings first and your stakeholders second. So to get to the human being, you need to ask questions and listen. And we all think that we're really good at listening, but it, active listening takes a lot of skill. So what are the key benefits of getting this stuff right? It's not just a nice to have, it's a game changer. You save yourself a huge amount of time and stress. You increase your chances that your project will be a huge success. 
and it helps you to deliver beneficial sustainable results and not those kind of terrible white elephants like um, Berlin Brandenburg Airport. Okay, what we want um, now is a little bit more input from you. So thank you for listening to my, my uh, stories and case studies there. Um, uh, so we are going to, uh, we're coming up to doing another poll um, shortly. Um, but just before that, and while you're thinking of um, getting ready to, to join me in polling, um, I think one of the key benefits of um, doing all the stakeholder engagement right is to avoid headlines like this for Berlin Airport. You know, even at opening, they found 120,000 defects and 170,000 kilometers of cable, which was dangerously wired. You know, you, you really can't make this stuff up. It's taken nine years to sort out the problem. So, a key benefit of getting stakeholder engagement right for me is that when people trust you, they fess up to their mess ups early on. We all know that to make mistakes is human, but it's also human to try and cover those mistakes up and hope nobody will actually notice. So you need to create an environment of mutual respect where people feel listened to and safe to speak out. And then they'll tell you about the mistakes and that to me is worth gold. So what I'd like to understand for you uh, from you now is um, how what stakeholder skills you'd like to be better at. So um, I'm going to try and pick the the right poll on this one. And again, it's a multiple choice one. Um, uh, the okay, um, it's not giving me the option to. Uh, oh yes, it is. It is giving me the option to do it. Thank you. Right. Um, we're launching the polling. Right. What stakeholder skills would you want to be better at? So do you want to uh, better prioritize the stakeholders from find the key ones from the many ones that uh, you've got to deal with? Uh, do you want to more effectively uh, identify and engage and influence stakeholders? Uh, or gain confidence to push back, which, you know, which ones could you potentially ignore or put set on one side? Um, maybe you just want some tools and techniques uh, to make your job and the communication more effective and efficient and uh, get good at collaborative de decision making, which is really, really important for innovation um, and uh, problem solving as well. Okay, so I'm seeing at the moment only half people have voted. So if you could uh, uh, get your votes and you say you can choose more than one option, it's multi choice there. Um, and I, I think the one that's actually uh, kind of like neck and neck here between engaging and influencing stakeholders and uh, that pushing back as well as the tools and techniques here. Okay, so I'm conscious. Uh, Oh yeah, we've got some we've got some more voters coming in now. That's great. Give it a couple more seconds before I share the results with you. That's brilliant. Okay, so um, there was the opportunity to um, add other if there was something there. You know, you wanted to put in chat, or we can pick it that up in the Q and A as well. So let me end the polling here and share the results with you. And the winner here. Oops. Okay, you can see more effectively identify, engage and influence those people. Yeah, um, I, I, I must admit um, there is a you know, sort of tendency to think that we've got to try and please everybody. And I really think it's important that we try and get at the, the most influential people and see how we can uh, work out how people can advocate for us. So we need to kind of start to learn about the stakeholders. And, and that's why it's important to talk to people, to listen, to consult early and efficiently. I'm going to stop sharing the results there with it. Okay. 
So for, for most of us, being good at these people skills like listening and building trust and influence, it's a journey, not a destination. We can all improve any stage of our career. And, and I hope I've illustrated why it's worth getting um, good at that. Uh, so, but like all this other stuff now, you know, on your to-do list, how do you find the time to actually do that? You're probably, you know, sort of uh, uh, wondering how you could possibly do this engagement stuff in just two minutes a day. Well, it's not easy, but it is doable. And it's the main reason why I became such a convert to uh, using AI simulations to train people because people skills are notoriously difficult to teach and you need to practice them uh, so that they become habitual. So if you try practicing them in the real world, you risk possibly trashing your career or making a fool of yourself or just having to learn everything the hard way. Um, so what we've got coming up uh, for Engineers Island is a, an engineer's guide to stakeholder management featuring an AI simulation workshop. And this is where you, you get chance you know, to work with this really cool AI simulation. You'll have 12 different stakeholders from all different aspects, key stakeholders uh, interacting with you with phone calls, emails and meetings and press releases on your project. And the clock will be ticking down uh, so that you know, it has this real sense of, of stress and pressure. And what we teach there is some of this appliance assigned, some things I've only been able to touch on today, we go into a lot more depths with. We, we give you this um, really effective tools that you get to practice. And then you just have two minutes a day throughout the simulation to interact with the stakeholders. So you get to practice in this realistic setting, which make, starts to then make these behaviors habitual. Um, I know that uh, uh, Elva and Quiva and my uh, colleague um, Ralph as well have, have seen the, the AI simulation in action. Uh, I don't know whether you'd like to um, just uh, say anything about the um, experience at all there. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to jump in, Trish. Um, so, so Elva and I, um, you know, sat in on a taster session, uh, very kindly organised by, by Trish and Ralph. And um, I have to say, I was a little bit apprehensive about how using the simulation would work in, you know, in a training environment. Um, but it was, um, it was really interesting. And I, I think um, probably the best thing that I got out of it was the idea that you're sort of thrown in the deep end a little bit. Um, but, you know, uh, you're, you're working in a small group and trying to sort of decide, you know, um, on those key decisions and who to sort of start with, you know, this kind of thing. Um, I, I found it, uh, it was actually, it was actually more fun than I thought, which is something that you don't necessarily think about when you think about training, um, that you're, you're actually, it's actually enjoyable. Um, but I think the most important thing, as you said, uh, Trish, is that the, the chance to fail, make mistakes and, and really learn from them. So, um, you know, if you kind of, you know, um, yeah, kind of make it make a mistake. It's it's a safe environment, and it's not going to have you know those real world consequences. So, um, yeah. So I suppose that's what I, I kind of gleaned from it. I don't know if um, Elva, you want to um, add anything to that? Yeah, just that I'd uh, fully agree. I concur. It was a great experience. Very enjoyable. Uh, the time went really fast, which is always a good sign. And um, yeah, there was the element, as you said, Trish, of a bit of stress and a lot of uh, things happening and multitasking and making decisions uh, quickly on, on your feet. So yeah, it's, it's a very good uh, experience. And uh, maybe Ralph would like to give a description as well. Sure, thanks, Elva. Um, I don't know about other people on this call, but I enjoy a good game of cards. Unfortunately, I'm not very good at it. Um, what I will often use as an excuse is that I've been dealt a bad hand. Um, now, I can't clearly be continually dealt a bad hand, um, but I will use that as an excuse very often. And I often think that's the way with projects sometimes that people tend to say that project didn't go quite as well as it could have done but maybe it was going to be or it was going to be tough for whoever got it and of course that can be true what is really nice about this 
simulation, this computer business game, if you like, is everybody plays exactly the same game. So the starting point is the same for everybody. The brief is the same for everybody. Yet, and I think Trish, you will support this after delivering this over so many years and over so many groups of people, is that you get completely different outcomes throughout the duration of the game and at the end of the game. But everybody starts with that level playing field. And what it does show is that the different decisions that you take throughout that project has a great bearing, a difference on the outcome, uh, sometimes by 100%. Yeah. And it, and it really clearly shows that to people. So if I was if I was doing it, and I have done it, I don't have the opportunity to blame my cards. It wasn't the cards that I was dealt. Yeah. Thanks, Ralph. That's a, that's a good analogy there. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, if uh, somebody wants to just pop the link into the chat for registration for that course, because there is a limited number of places. It's two um, four-hour sessions on consecutive days in May. And, and, and you get, you know, sort of there's a uh, myself as a facilitator coaching you and, 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 and you do this immersive game. It's really good fun. And you end up, you know, with the tools and techniques to identify and engage your key stakeholders um, and you learn to and practice. Uh, how to build consensus very quickly, two minutes a day. And while you're playing, you build and hone your collaboration skills to, to, to help you minimize conflict and become more effective. So um, I think uh, there will be a link to the, uh, oh yes, we're gonna share the details of what, what, what uh, workshop in, a, in an email afterwards, of course. Um, and I'm sure if you miss out on the limited places or can't make the dates, I'm sure uh, our lovely colleagues, Elva and Quiva, will put on extra dates to beat demand later in the year. So I, I just want to thank you so much for giving me your time today and uh, your input to the chat and polls, which has been really interesting. I'm going to hand back to uh, Elva to talk to about Q&A and CPD as well. So um, uh, I'll be around for your questions for the remainder of the session.